Well, we are in Matthew 27, picking up today in verse 32. Uh, last week, Raymond covered down to verse 31, did an awesome job. I thought, wow, that, is, that was a great... You know, if you, if you want to know how to pray for me and the church, just pray for the Holy Spirit to fall, God's anointing. You know, the, the thing I, I've noticed in this COVID, we got to watch several different churches, and some of these guys are such elegant speakers but I did not sense the power of God's Holy Spirit in their sermon. It was very accurate. It was very well laid out. But you want the Holy Spirit to fall upon the guy speaking. You know, you want to be a vessel full of the Holy Spirit. But then also that God would give everybody ears to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying. We, we don't want to play church. And I think that's what God's doing. I, I think he's saying, hey, guys. You're, you're able to play church without really being Christians. So I'm not going to let you play church anymore. What are you going to do with that? We're like, well, we, we can't have church. Sure, the Lord said, I'll build my church. He didn't say, oh, you guys can have church. I died on the cross, so you guys can have church. <laughs> Sounds like a little girl playing with dolls, doesn't it? <laughs> he, he said, I'm building my church. Do you think Christ is waiting for the COVID season to get over so he can start building the church again? Or is he doing it in better ways than he's ever done it before? Because we're having to be challenged. And so he says we are the church. Isn't that great? Individually, he sprinkled us like salt out of a salt shaker all over the community. And now is our opportunity to do what the Lord said. Go into the world and what? Make disciples. To say to your neighbor, hey, I'm going to be reading through the Gospel of John. Would you like to do that one hour with me? And we'll read it and talk about it. Or we're going to have some Christian Foundation material. It's eight weeks of how to be a Christian. We're going to get those books to you here in the coming weeks. And, I mean, what do you have to lose? They say, no. Okay. I mean, in many countries, you go talk to your neighbor about Jesus. The secret police show up, and they, they put you in a special camp to, to brainwash you for even the suggestion of seeing about somebody wanting to be a Christian. We don't have that yet, but California will be on the, the cutting edge of that, no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> um, so you pull up and you get gas and somebody's there next to you, just say, hey, I was reading this morning in Ephesians 2 and this verse spoke to me. Can I, can I read it to you also? What, what are they gonna do? quit pumping their gas real quick and run away <laughs> I think I think most people are spiritually hungry especially now we are having a suicide rate nationwide that that is almost as bad as the COVID there are a couple of states they've had more suicides than they have had people die of the COVID without God without hope in this world so we can't play church, so let's be the church. Let's actually tell people about Jesus. Invite them to come out here if, you, if that's on your heart. That's not our end goal. Our end goal is not to get people in church. Our end goal is to share Christ with them and let Christ be their shepherd, and he can lead them to whatever pastor he wants, whether it's the Baptist church or the Pentecostal church or the Methodist, whatever the Lord wants to lead them. We're, our end goal is not to try to get more people here. The end goal is that they would know Jesus and follow Jesus, right? So you don't have any pressure other than just to open your mouth. David said, open your mouth wide and he'll fill it. And so we, Jesus said a couple of things. He said, go and make disciples, be one yourself, a learner, a grow in the word. David said, I've hid God's word in my heart that I don't sin against him. In Psalm 1, it says, meditate in his word day and night, even while you're sleeping, while you're awake. And he'll prosper you in all you do. Anybody need to prosper right now? How about in everything you do? There it is. The grand poobah of all promises hinged to just taking some of God's word, whether it's one verse or ten chapters, it's not relevant. But that God spoke to your heart. And, and, and the, with that anointing, with the Holy Spirit upon you, now you take the word that God gave to your weary soul in the day, and you share it to another weary soul in the day. 
That's it. We can now be the church. And, and so we're going to keep talking about that. But today in Matthew 27, Lord, open our ears to hear today what your spirit is saying. Last week, uh, we left off in verse 31, Matthew 27, 31, and they led him away to be crucified. Such a powerful, powerful passage. And from there, they would give the prisoners who were going to be crucified, not the whole cross. I know you've seen some guys carrying the, the vertical part and the horizontal part. You know, there's one guy that put a wheel on his and walked from the Pacific coast to the Atlantic and had thousands of people show up and watch him. And he actually did share the gospel. It was rather strange, but it, it did work. But they would carry the, the horizontal part called the patabolum. And it was about 75 to 125 pounds, depending. You got to realize they had all kinds of crosses. They had some that were in X fashion, some in a T fashion, some that was just a post. But we know from the description the Bible gives us, he, Jesus was on the T fashion. And given that horizontal part, and this is again why we think he was on the T fashion cross, and he was walking with it. And uh, it reminds me of that verse in Matthew 16, 24. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You got to realize the cross was more than, more than an instrument of death. It was shameful death. It was shaming you. They would make you naked. They would make you hang there for days. They typically put it right on the freeway. In this case with Jesus, it was on two freeways, one going east and west and one going north and south. If you were going through Jerusalem, you were going to pass that corner where Jesus was hanged. So if imagine we said, unless you take up your noose that somebody can hang you on and follow me, and you put a noose around your neck and you walk around with the noose. It's, it's shameful, isn't it? It's degrading. It's more than just taking a bullet and shooting them or slitting their throat. It's, it's lasting a long time. It's hanging high so everybody can see it. And the, and the idea is that you wouldn't just die, but you would be shamed before you died. This is what they were doing to Jesus. And Jesus says this, Unless you are willing to follow me in such a humble way that it doesn't matter that people are shaming you. I don't care if I'm shamed for being a Christian. Boy, today they are shaming us, aren't they? And there's something wrong if we're ashamed. Oop, I don't want anybody to know at work I'm a Christian because I know what's going to happen. It's, they're going to bring shame on me somehow for being a Christian. Uh, I, I talk to my neighbors, but I don't want them to know I'm a Christian because I don't want that, that heaviness of every going, the Christian lives there. Are, are we willing to take on the shame of being a Christian? Jesus says, unless you, 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 you've humbled yourself to that degree and you don't care what men say about you, you don't care that men shame you for following Jesus, then you can't come after me. And today in verse 32 to 34, Matthew 27, Now as they came out, they found a man, Cyrene, Simon by name. Him they compelled to bear his cross. And when they had come to the place called Gagatha, that is to say, the place of the skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. And when he had tasted it, he would not drink it. So first of all, we see this guy from Cyrene. Guys, that is indeed from Africa, North Africa, about 800 miles away. There's little doubt in the commentators, commentaries for the last 2,000 years, this was a black man. He was probably picked out of the crowd because he was a black man. You, you say, well, was he a slave? Understand, in the Roman Empire, you had Romans and you had slaves. Everybody was a slave. There were more slaves than there were free people. And Paul addresses this in the book of Philemon, a little book. And he also 
in, in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 7, he covers that. He said a lot of people that are reading these letters are slaves. And he says, don't worry about it. As you're already a slave of Christ anyway. Now be a slave of men and, and, and be a light even there. So here is this black man. It, it's interesting. Because we know that none of this happened coincidentally. There were dozens of prophecies. Jesus would be betrayed by 30 pieces of silver. They would take his clothes and, and divide them up. That's all a thousand years in advance spoken of. Well, there's no doubt that God, before time began, picked out this black man to carry that paddle bull and that horizontal part of the cross to the Via Della Rosa, that path from the prison out to Golgotha. It was quite a ways. It was, up, it was going uphill. We know that they would spit on you and rip out your beard and throw rocks at you and kick you and humiliate you all the way. When I take a trip to Israel, that's one of my favorite spots to go from that Roman uh, fortress and take the Via Della Rosa. That's in Spanish, the way of suffering. It is humbling. I like people to put the song on that. Have you guys heard that song? If not, YouTube it. The Via Della Rosa. And uh, not now. <laughs> Ooh, hey. No, after the service. <laughs> and so, in essence, we could say to the Lord, Black Lives Matter. He picked a black man to carry the cross. Now, for us, that would have been the honor of honors of honors, wouldn't it? And it actually did become that in the church. This guy, Simon, became a rather popular guy. Interesting, two of his sons became pastors. We know about this in Mark 15, 2. It said they compelled a certain man, Simon the Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, who was coming out of the country and passing by to bear his cross. So they said, you, you know this Cyrenian. You know this African guy, because you know his two sons. In Romans 16, 13, he mentions one of them. Greet Rufus, the chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. So Paul actually adopted these guys like his own family. Si Simon's wife became like his mom. And Rufus and Alexander, his sons, pastors in the church, one a pastor in Rome, was very much Paul included as part of their family. And if you go to Israel today, you will see a large number of black Jews. You go, wow, really? Yeah, they've been, when the Lord said, I'm scatter, scattering Israel to the four corners of the earth, he really meant it. Tremendous story. They've actually made a couple of movies about it. You can read books about this. But in Ethiopia, they were having a genocide amongst these Ethiopians that had segregated themselves. And the Ethiopian government was going in and just wiping them out, killing them all. And these men sent to Israel and said, hey, we are Jews. And they said, how can that be? So they sent men over and they investigated it. And sure enough, they believed their lineage was um, from Solomon and the Queen of Sheba or one of the other women that had come. And they had for hundreds of years been living according to the law, being circumcised and so forth. There's actually a tradition that says Jeremiah knowing that Israel was going to be ransacked by the Babylonians, because God had prophesied it, that he actually took the Ark of the Covenant and sent it to Ethiopia. And they believe that it's there today. Quite an interesting story. So in the 70s, when these black Ethiopians were getting wiped out, Israel just gutted 747s, took all their chairs out, and just filled up as many... They got agreements with the country for a very small window. 
to get them out. And they were just loading 747s with hundreds of these people, getting them to Israel as quick as possible. And unfortunately, tens of thousands of them were murdered. But when they came to Israel, they had been living so rustically, they didn't know what an indoor toilet was. They didn't know what a faucet was. They didn't know how to run an oven. They, they, they had been living a very, very rustic, separate life because they were Jews. Quite an interesting story. And so I, I just think, again, when we look in heaven, it says all were worshiping all the believers of every tongue, of every nation, of every people, that we are going to have the full smorgasbord, okay? Nobody lacking. And I can tell you, we've started several churches up in the Andy Mountains of Peru, and you got the most Peruvian-looking people that love the Lord, that before were either into some kind of Catholicism slash witchcraft that are now serving the Lord. And so I, I think this is just a, a very interesting nuance to the story that's very fitting today. Yes, black lives have always mattered. Unfortunately, this group, the actual nonprofit organization, is a, a demonic group, a very evil group. And, um, and as much as we want to say, yes, black lives matter, they've always mattered to us. So do Mexicans and Chinese and you know, go down the list. Yes, of course they matter. Christ died for the whole what? World. Yes. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. Right? Of course that's true. And yes, let's stop at a moment in history and, and re-say that. Because I, I do believe the black person in America has, has gotten a, real, a really bad deal, especially with police officers pulling them over. The church I pastored in San Diego was very multicultured. Our son, since he was a little boy, grew up, his best friend was black. He's, they would have seasons they'd stay at his house and have seasons they'd stay at our house. They were best of best friends until my son passed away about six years ago. And, and there were many black people in the church. It just wasn't an issue. But many of those black friends of mine, many of them were wealthy, businessmen, well-educated. They would get pulled over by police more than once a year, asked to get out of their car, walk backwards, frisk them. You know, I, it's never happened to me as a white man. But it's happened to them several times. So I, I, do, I do understand that there's a point in time that we have to, to say that, that we're, we're crossing bounds. But outside of that, not to be political at all, yes, the question answered, yes. The Lord gave a black man a great, great honor. In the moment, it probably seemed like, you're picking on me because I'm black. And, and this is horrible. And, and, and no doubt it was, all of those things. But yet, in the Lord, God turns all things around for good, right? To those, those who love and are called according to his purpose. Well, they got to Golgotha. That, that's the Greek word, Golgotha. The Latin word is Calvary. So when we go and plant Calvary chapels in most countries, there's already Calvary chapels there. They're Catholic churches. So instead of calling them Calvary chapels, we call them Golgotha chapels. Because in the Greek, it works in the culture. But you say Calvary, it sounds like a Catholic church. And like I said, uh, I know in, I believe it's Rio de Janeiro, there's the Calvary chapel is a Catholic church. It's been around for about 100 years. So it can get quite confusing. So Golgotha, the, and it means the place of the school. Interesting, if you go today... There was a general in England who found this mountainside. And again, it's not up on a hill. There is a hill, but the hill itself looks like a skull. And, and that's where, again, the two roads, north, south, east, and west, went. And interesting that nothing through all of the thousands of years since Christ died had ever been built there. And it's major prime real estate. But in the late 80s, they built a bus stop there. Nobody wanted to have a business there. But now there's a, a bus stop, but still you can see the hill. And right next to it is, we call it, Gordon's uh, burial site for Jesus. It's right, right close by to it. So when we go through the, 
the place where Jesus was buried, they bring you to an area and you can look at the side of the hill and it looks like a skull. I will say this though, since I've been going there uh, in the 80s, it's, it's starting to disintegrate. And but yet they have pictures of what it looked like 20, 30 years ago and it was more distinct at that time. But I know a lot of people and I was one of them going, hey, up there's where Jesus was crucified on the hill. No, all of Jerusalem is the hill. <laughs> Um, it doesn't say that Jesus himself was crucified. But what about the song, On a Hill Far Away? I know, it's not in the Bible. <laughs> but I do love that song. But the hill far away is, is the hill of the entire city of Jerusalem. And, um, and this, again, was outside the city walls. Why is that significant? Because after... The animal was used to take away sins. The animal would be taken outside the camp, outside the city walls, to be taken care of. In Hebrews 13, verse 11 through 13, For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin is later burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate therefore let us go forth to him outside the camp bearing his reproach so it was very very significant after jesus was beaten and brutalized and whipped with a whip and the crown of thorns upon his head his garments stripped away from him before that bloody stuff started happening and and after being bruised for our iniquities beaten and chastised for our well-being that our sins could be forgiven that that at that point he he was half dead he couldn't even carry the patabolum he was probably falling down and struggling and going slow and the romans finally said as much as we want you to be humiliated having to carry that patabolum we're going to have to have somebody else do it or we're never going to get to the place to crucify you you may be dead before we get to the place to crucify you and um and so, again, this is all a part of the prophecy being fulfilled that he was taken outside the camp. And it says very simply at the beginning of verse 35, Then they crucified him. Boy, to try to explain what that crucifixion was like. When I was in my late teens and early 20s, there was a book that we were told to read. And it's called A Doctor Looks at the Crucifixion, a whole book on it. And he actually goes through the body parts and the nails and what were happening to the tendons and the ligaments. And he goes into incredible description, the pain and the agony somebody would go through with a crucifixion like Christ. And uh, it would take me literally a couple hours to explain it if I went into detail. But you can imagine having a giant spike driven through your right hand. I mean... If you, I think probably all of us have had our finger hit by a hammer, right? Just a little hammer. Ah! We're trying not to blaspheme and use God's name in vain. And But imagine a nail being driven through your hand. And you know another one's coming after that. And then a nail through your feet. You get it through one and then put it on top of the other one. It would have been very difficult and messy. And the pain is an, uh, unbelievable. And then once they get it, they now have him on the cross. They hoist it up, and boom, you fall into it. And your body goes up, and it's like you don't have the strength to pick yourself up, but you're suffocating. So you, you're, you wake yourself up because you're suffocating, and your body just sort of convulses and gets up. And Jesus' back has, has already been just hamburgerized through the beating already of the whip. And pulling himself up that splintery cross. And to get here and to be able to get a little oxygen to his brain. He had seven short sayings on the cross if you compare all the Gospels. And every time he came to the top, it wasn't about him. It was about John, take care of mom. It was to the thief, today you'll be with me in paradise. 
to everybody. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That even in that incredible agony, Jesus wasn't focused on himself, but on the whole world and their sorrow, their grief, their needs. Incredible. Well, in verse 35 to 44, Then they crucified him, divided up his garments, casting lots, that they might fulfill which was spoken in the prophets. They divided my garments among them, and my clothing they cast lots. Sitting down, they kept watch over him there, and they put him up on his, they put above his head an accusation written against him, This is the king of the Jews. Then the two robbers crucified with him, one on the right, the other on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, Who, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Likewise, the chief priests also mocking with the scribes and the elders said, He saved others, himself he cannot save. If he's the king of Israel, let him now come down from the cross, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he will have him. For he said, I'm the son of God. Even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. So if you're wondering if things got out of hand and they're beyond Jesus' control, when he, they came to arrest him, Jesus lost all control. They should put that thought to bed. Because they take his garments... And these Romans, they must have been nice garments, the one thing he had of value. And they wanted those garments. Maybe sort of like people want stuff from Ted Bundy today or something. It might have had some kind of sick, twisted value because of Jesus' popularity. Or he knew that some of his past followers might pay a good penny for it. Or maybe the clothes themselves were valuable. But again, this was all prophesied in advance. In Psalms 22, 18, they divided my garments among them for my clothing. They cast lots a thousand years in advance. He told them that this was going to happen. Why? So we know it's 100% in control. This is so important. Jesus didn't lose control. He says, no man takes my life. I lay it down. And so he's given us these little breadcrumbs along the way to say, even though it looked like evil was prevailing, (laughs) even though it looked like God was losing, even though it looked like people were going further than God had intended, that none of that is true. Every little detail is happening because God is allowing it. His garments, you got to realize... To a Jew, garments are very significant because they identify a lot of things. They identify the region you're from. They identify your family. They identify what branch of Judaism you're a part of. When you go to Israel today, you'll see guys with different colors, um, little hats. Some of them are to the left, some are to the right, some are with one pin hooking on, some have two pins hooking on. Every little angle, every little movement identifies what where they are from and who they are recognized with. Be like, hey, let me straighten that up for you. It's like, no, no, he he did that. It looks like it's falling off, but he did that on purpose. And then let's just say it. Jesus lost everything. Right down to his clothes and right down to his dignity. Naked we come into this world and what? (laughs) Naked we go out how true it is but more importantly it gives us that understanding in 2 Corinthians 8 9 for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that though he was rich yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his poverty might become rich that you through his his poverty why can't I say that word poverty poverty I know that word well. I've never struggled saying that word in my entire life. I have struggled with poverty. That is true. But not saying the word. That through his poverty, there we go, we might become rich. 
and the sign over his head. This is the king of the Jews. In John 19, 21, the Pharisees saw that and they said, take that down or we put another one above it saying, he says he's the king of the Jews. By this time, Pilate had enough of him. He goes, no, it says what it says. Leave it alone. And uh, so the Pharisees were quite mad about that, that it had a true statement in the midst of so many false things. And then the robber on each side of him. There's Jesus looking as he's walking the Via Della Rosa, not one kind face, not one friendly smile, not one comforting word. He was alone. He was suffering alone. And there was nothing but meanness around him, vileness around him, blaspheming around him. And then he goes to the cross, and they're shouting at him. They're spewing to him. Look at the four things they mocked in those verses we just read. They mocked him as the Savior. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. They mocked him as a king. There with the thing above him. He's the king of the Jews. This is a joke. They mocked him as a believer. He trusted in God. Well, let's see if he will have him. If God even wants this guy. They mocked him as the son of God. For he says, I'm the son of God. Let's see if he will deliver him. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows. We esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. Man looked on Jesus when he was a little boy. And they said, man, that guy, it seems like God's against him. The Bible tells us he was, his entire life, he was a man who suffered, struggled, so now he could aid us in all our suffering and struggles. Well, he only lived to be 33. He has no idea what it's like to be 44. I, I know, but from the day he was born till the day he died, man looking outward at Jesus and his circumstances and living in Nazareth, they would just say, nothing ever goes right for that guy. It seems like everything that guy is doing has a struggle with it. And now right up into the cross, they are saying, look at him. God's not for him. God's against him. If this great rabbi was truly holy, would God let him die in such a sinner's death? And we see here in Matthew that both of the thieves, you'd think going to your own death you'd be sober-minded. But that's how wicked these thieves are. Even going to their own death, they are willing to spend their energy mocking Jesus. That's a, that's a special hard heart, guys. So not only down below him, but even side to side, guys who also would be looking for kindness and, and comfort and, and looking for a face of pity or empathy, they were spending their energy looking at Jesus, repeating the very things that the religious leaders were saying to Jesus. But we know in Luke 23 what happened, don't we? It tells us there that one of the thieves, before he died, he believed on Jesus. In Romans 10, it says, if you believe... Jesus is Lord, and God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. This thief did. He said, Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. All those things he said if you put all the Gospels together. And Jesus said what? Today you'll be with me in paradise. I, I just want to say a couple of things here, and we're going to finish up. We're not going to get as far as I'd hoped today. But you may be here today, or you may be listening on one of the various avenues of social media or the radio or wherever this message ends up. And you're saying, I have sinned too greatly. I have sinned too many times. Or I have sinned too long of a duration over my life. 
There was a time in my 20s, my 30s, where my heart was touched, and I actually went to church for a while with a girlfriend of mine who was a Christian. And, and God genuinely did something in my life. And I did follow him for a while, but then, you know, I got a, a motorboat, and then that was it, you know. Had to go skiing on weekends. And now you're living a very shameful, sinful life. Maybe not openly. Maybe your sins are in such a way that people don't know about them. You're able to hide them. Some sins we commit, or everybody knows it. Other sins, we can keep them hidden really well. And you're thinking, yeah, I had my chance, but I threw it away. Let this man be an example. His entire life, he was such an incorrigible thief that they crucified him. They didn't do that. They beat him, let him go, prisoned him for a couple months, let him go. You don't crucify thieves. But this thieves, these thieves were so bad. They had beaten them. They had imprisoned them. They had done everything they could to humiliate them, to try to get them to say, the punishment's not worth the crime. But these guys weren't going to stop until they were put to death. And evidently the outcry of the people is, we want it public, we want to see it, we want these guys humiliated because they have been such a rotten part of our community. But yet, the end of this guy's energy, we know how hardened they are, don't we? Why they're carrying their own patabolum, <laughs> they're also mocking Jesus. Why they're being hung on their own cross, they're still spewing mockery at Jesus. That's a hard heart, it's hard to imagine. But yet, when he hears Jesus say, John, take care of mom. Father, forgive him, they know not what they do. This thief had faith. He said, it wouldn't matter how bad I have been. It wouldn't matter that I've been so bad my entire life, right up till moments before I die. It doesn't matter how deep, it doesn't matter how many, this guy will receive me. That's a tremendous amount of faith, isn't it? But yet he was right. Jesus wasn't sarcastic. Yeah, you'd like that, wouldn't you, buddy? Go to hell. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. After mocking me, now you want me to say something nice to you back? You know, There was no sarcasm with Jesus, was there? There was just kindness. In the couple of seconds why he would get up the cross and <gasps> catch his breath and his brain would come back to know what's going on. He heard this guy, probably not in a very clear way, asked to, that Jesus would receive him. When Jesus comes into his kingdom, he believed that Jesus was going to raise again. And he believed he would raise again. And he believed that Jesus' heart of forgiveness, Father, forgive him. I believe those words of Jesus. They put faith into my heart that whatever he asks the Father will be done. And that he is a righteous man dying on this cross and he will righteously raise again. And all of those who are with him will raise also with him. Jesus. Lord, when, future tense, you come into your kingdom, remember me. Is that the worst sinner's prayer you've ever heard? It didn't matter, did it? It wasn't about the praise. It was about the prayer. It was about the faith in his heart, wasn't it? And Jesus said, that's it. That's saving's faith. What an example to everybody. His hands are tied. His feet are tied. This man will never do one work to earn salvation, right? All his works have been horrible his entire life. Not one good work why he could step upon the earth. But yet he's going to share the same heaven with all those who believed in Christ. We're going to see that thief up there. He's going to be not wealthy in heaven. The Bible says when we do good works unto God that there's a reward waiting for us in heaven. He won't have very many rewards, but he'll have eternity with Jesus isn't that, isn't that amazing? I, I love that story. Because Jesus didn't die with the top 10% good people sins on him. I only want to pick out the best. 
top 10% of man that's ever lived, I'll die for their sins because they're, they're already 90% of the way there anyway. No. Jesus bore all the sins of the world right down to every hideous serial killer, right down to the Hitlers and the Mussolinis, right down to the most despicable, wicked things man can do. Christ died for those sins that those despicable, sinful men without works, by faith alone, and the work of Christ could have eternal life. Well, Lord, we come before you now and we thank you for your word today. We know that you have something you're doing in all of us here today. You're putting your word into our heart. You're causing all of us to be fired up to, to go and share the good news. You're causing all of us to be the church and, and, and to become truly disciples and making disciples. And Lord, if we have reduced down our walk with you with just a simple go to church on Sunday morning and not think about God too much the rest of the week, forgive us. It's in you we want to live and move and have our being. It's in you where there's life and joy and peace and, 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 the, and the real adventure of life is walking in you, walking in the Spirit, being filled with your Spirit and speaking through the power of your Spirit and living a life in the Spirit. Lord, please, do that work in us. If you're not a believer here today, before you take communion, I would encourage you right now to say, Lord, that's me. Matter of fact, I'm not even as bad as that thief on the cross. And if you're willing to forgive him, you're willing to forgive me. Lord, I'm that guy that, that threw you away in my 20s, my 30s, my 40s. I was walking with you for a year, for 40 years, and I threw my relationship with you away, and I've been living a very selfish, self-seeking, wicked life ever since then. And every time I think about myself praying to you, I, it makes me sick. Every time I think about praying to you, I feel like a hypocrite. Every time I sing a song, I feel like I'm just not worthy to do that. Lord, today I come in faith believing that you have died for all my sins. Even in this season where I've wandered away from you, even in this season that I have so trampled underfoot the cross of Christ, forgive me. Forgive me that I've insulted the spirit of grace, but I know there's no sin that you can't forgive. I understand there's no depths that your grace won't extend to. And right now, Lord, I want you in my life. I want to pray to you without feeling like a hypocrite. I want to sing to you without it turning my stomach. I want to read the Bible. Even though I'm not worthy, you have made me worthy. And even now, your heart is the same. Father, forgive us all. Forgive them all, Lord. And if you're here today, believe that. Lord Jesus, forgive me. I receive that forgiveness. I receive you into my life. Wash me, cleanse me, heal me. In Jesus' name, amen.